What's up everybody, it's Joe here with Joseph Blake Photography and in today's video we have a ton of updates to the entire suite of Creative Cloud apps from Adobe as well as announcements from the Adobe Max conference Building. I mean, oh. yes. about a bunch of AI features that are coming. Some of them are already here to our Adobe apps. Hey everybody, I'm Joe. I'm a portrait and landscape photographer here in Las Vegas, Nevada. This is my channel, Joseph Blake Photography, where we talk about tech and news and gear and reviews and how to's and all the things that content creators use, whether it's here on YouTube, other places in social media, if you're delivering to clients, if you're just shooting for your friends and family. On this channel, we talk about the tech and the methods that we use that tech, the how to's and all the info to get that stuff done. If that's the type of stuff that you're interested in, I'd really appreciate it if you hit the subscribe button. And if at the end of the video, you think I've done a good job, I'd really appreciate it if you hit the like button. Obviously you can follow me on all the socials down below, but now let's jump in and start. So first we're gonna start on the video side of things with Adobe Premiere Pro. So Adobe Premiere Pro has just been announced with a new beta feature from the Adobe Max conference called expand or generative expand. So how often, and this is the question that Adobe poses, how often have you been editing your footage and find yourself either cutting or transitioning from clip to clip and you just don't have that those last few frames? Maybe your subject just starts, stops talking and starts talking about something else or maybe you realize that the next segment isn't applicable or maybe information has changed this happens to me all the time and you've got to cut it but when you cut it then you end up with this really weird ending or maybe like i do all the time right when i think i'm done talking i look over to my screen to make sure that i'm on message and following i keep my outline over here and so it looks awkward, right? I look over to the side or look over to my screen here. It doesn't look good. And so you wanna cut and then expand from there or get a few more frames. And so generative extend allows you to add those extra frames. Now, Adobe claims that this tool is based on commercially safe generative information and is based on their Firefly model that has only been trained on things that effectively they were supposed to train it on. So whether you have gaps in your footage, whether you need to do a transition and need just a few more frames, or you just need to hold a shot just a little bit longer to make things sync up to the right timeline for you, that's where this tool comes in. And not just for video, this tool also works for audio. So if you've got an audio clip or if you have a voiceover component that you need that room tone to complete, or you need that room tone to continue over uh, into the next clip, or maybe you have a audio effect that just isn't long enough, it'll let you extend it just a little bit longer for that cut to make sense. So now Generative Extend is currently in beta. It's really only available in 1080p and 720p resolution, only in 16 by nine aspect ratio with between 12 and 30 frames per second in standard dynamic range with audio in either mono or stereo. Additionally, Adobe has announced and demoed their text to video feature in their Firefly model. The idea is that this feature will be baked into products like Adobe Premiere and Adobe After Effects to allow you to add in things like missing shots and effects that previously you might have gone to stock photography services or videography services to access, or maybe going to places that you just would not have been able to shoot in. The demos that they posted on the Adobe Max announcement page are pretty convincing. And one of the effects that I saw that was actually pretty interesting and convincing uh, was their pr prismatic lens effects that you would then layer on top of to kind of make things look a little bit more cinematic. They also demoed stop motion and B-roll imagery as a potential outcome of this model, which again points to the stock footage uh, component of this. Currently, the Firefly video model is available to be joined as a waitlist item. I've thrown my name in the hat, stay subscribed to the channel, and as this product becomes available, I will be demoing it pretty heavily. For creators that are heavily using Adobe Express, there were a ton of new features and improvements announced as well at Adobe Max, like surprise AI capabilities, integration with Adobe Fonts, integration with Adobe Lightroom, generative expand, resize, and bulk create options, similar to what you've been able to do with Canva for quite some time. One-click uh, brand recolor and mood boards, also something that you've been able to do with Canva for a while. 
Shape drawing and sound effects are now also included. Language translation is an additional feature, as well as shared calendars. And for the folks collaborating on a marketing team, now there are integrations with Slack, HubSpot, and Webflow. Next, moving over to the photo side, we have changes to Adobe Camera Raw. So if you don't know, when you import photos into Lightroom or into Photoshop that are raw, the Adobe Camera Raw feature is the same in both. And it's actually a separate application that runs or a separate component of the application that runs on your computer. This most recent update includes a new color profile. And if you're not familiar with color profiles, it's it's kind of Adobe's version of what you would traditionally shoot with on your camera. So for example, if on your Canon camera, you traditionally shoot in portrait or landscape. And it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't affect your image if you're shooting in RAW, but when the image is imported, Lightroom can reflect that image in that same profile or you can change it. And Adobe has their own profiles where they take the raw information and they analyze it and present to you what they think is the best version of that image. And this is before you make any manual adjustments to things like brightness and exposure and shadows and clarity and texture and all those sorts of things. This is literally just the way that the image is translated into what you see on screen. And Adobe has released an updated version called Adaptive. And in reading the description from Adobe, it sounds honestly a lot like some of the kind of presets that come with Lightroom now that allow you to do adaptive modification, except instead of it being kind of like an action that applies different adjustments and masks and things like that, it's just baked into the way that the image is imported into Lightroom or Photoshop using Adobe Camera Raw. And this profile is designed both to work with HDR and SDR images. So unlike previous presets or profiles like Adobe Color or Adobe Landscape that just kind of said, okay, well, if it's a landscape shot, we're gonna add this, or we're gonna remove that, or we're gonna drain, you know, pull this color down or put this contrast up, it is image dependent. So first it will analyze the image and use their AI algorithms to determine kind of what is the best for this particular shot. It'll take a look at highlights, it'll take a look at shadows, it'll see where detail is, and it will adjust accordingly. Some of those adjustments happen globally across the entire image. Some of those adjustments happen in individual areas or subjects similar to masking. Now, some of these changes are slight and some of them are pretty extreme. It's really going to be dependent on the image and how you shot it and whether or not it was super high contrast or your shadows are very dark or your highlights are very bright. It's gonna depend on the image and how Adobe feels it should be adapted and then you would go in and adjust it. So we'll have to put this through a few iterations. We'll have to put this through a few tests to see for sure. Additionally, in Adobe Lightroom, they're adding new AI shortcuts, which feel a lot like actions in Photoshop to be able to add things like masks, identify people, apply background blur. Again, more of the same from those kind of adaptive presets, but taken to the next level. I don't know how much of this is AI or how much of it is just it's recognizing that it's a scene with people and it's gonna move towards what it thinks is going to be the best profile correction. Like all of those steps together in identifying what subjects are in the image and then applying what it thinks would be kind of the best for that image, all kind of laid out in a shortcut instead of you having to do it step by step by step. Again, this will need extensive testing, but again, if you are a working pro photographer who spends lots of time doing minute adjustments in Lightroom, this might be a good way to start assuming that these things aren't too kind of over the top and wild. Next, we have the generative remove feature, which has been in Lightroom. I did a video about that earlier this year. I wasn't a fan, <laughs> to be quite honest. I thought that the version in Photoshop was considerably better. It looks like they've improved it, and now it feels a lot more like the one in Photoshop. So, good job. Additionally, they've added improved performance in the Adobe Lightroom Classic Develop Mode, which is much appreciated. They've improved support for tethered shooting for Nikon shooters. They've also added expanded HDR support. And this is a big one, I think, for those of you who are looking to export your photos out of Lightroom into something like Apple Photos or specifically Instagram and have them visible both as high dynamic and standard dynamic range images. Also known as embedded ISO HDR gain map. So you can make one file, it'll support both gain levels, and it is supported in apps like Instagram. Also, users on Mac desktops and iOS mobile will be able to edit video 
in HDR in Lightroom now. Additional updates for Lightroom include new support for their AI denoise feature. Now, if you've used the denoise feature, it is great. I did a video about some of those updates just a little bit ago. So check that out to see how that feature looks. But it relied on, but it relied on raw data that included bare Xtrans information off the sensor. And if your sensor didn't support that, then it wouldn't work. And so now it seems that it will support a whole host of DNG and Panorama files, as well as Apple DNG, Apple RAW, Samsung Galaxy Expert RAW DNG, Google Pixel RAW, and other RAW files from Canon, Nikon, Sony, and Leica. One test I wanna throw into it is whether or not the converted files that I have from scans of my negatives from my film camera will work that have been turned into DNGs. You can also now set preview cache levels in your Lightroom Classic to modify the size of your catalog uh, if it's getting a little too big on your hard drive. Additionally, Lightroom Non-Classic is getting a lot of updates to their workflows, including smart albums. These are searches that then can be turned into smart albums and used later. The ability to connect to third-party editing apps, batch application of presets, and a screen reader accessibility mode. With these changes, along with the change last year with the ability to keep your files local, Adobe is this close, I think, to what I would consider feature parity. Almost enough for me to switch. I just need to be able to import multiple photos into layers in 16-bit RAW into Photoshop. Additionally, in Lightroom, as well as Photoshop, is the new AI distraction removal feature. Run that again. We got cables going horizontally and crisscrossing, covering up the details of this beautiful building. I mean, oh. yes, that is awesome. So that's our before and our after. Check that out. Again, that is fine distractions inside of the remove tool. This will see. So this takes the remove feature. I think we've all been using this feature for the kind of same reason. Um, which is, you know, we're not, we're not taking out a ton of stuff, but every once in a while, right, there's a little person off in the background, maybe there's a power line going through the image, maybe there's just some, some rocks or some trash or something that you didn't see through the viewfinder or when you were kind of looking around because you were moving quick and you're trying to get clients taken care of and get the best shot, get the framing, get the posing, they've got kids, they've got a dog, whatever it is, you were working quick and you didn't notice these things. You're not a superhero, you can't do it all. So now in Lightroom, as well as Photoshop, we've been able to, right, remove those things out. And the remove tool has done pretty well with that. I've got a video here that I will link that you can look at that shows off the remove tool and how I use it in a studio environment. But sometimes there's a lot to remove, a lot of little things. And now they have introduced a new beta feature that allows you to, with one click, identify and remove all of what it considers distracting items in your image without you having to actually draw them all out. So you can tell Adobe Photoshop to find distractions. It'll tell you which ones it finds, and then you click on them and it just removes them. They've also added the ability for you to decide if you want this feature to include generative AI. So in some instances, it might just use what it can find in your image, similar to the healing brush tool or the stamp tool, or you can actually just generate what it thinks would be the best. And you can actually now choose to set that to auto, on, or off, which I think is really great if you are a purist and you just don't wanna have any generative features in that particular tool. But now the generative fill, generative expand, generative background, and generative similar tools in Photoshop and Lightroom are now all powered by the Firefly 3 model which Adobe claims creates significantly improved photorealistic quality, better understands complicated prompts, and generates more variety in its outputs. But here's my question to you, if you're a working pro, a working photographer, videographer, how much are you using these features? And how much are we just seeing these features being used for the sake of using them? Adobe has also announced the generative workspace, which looks to be kind of like a sandbox to create ideas, to favorite things, and to create assets that you would potentially reuse or that you think are a, a good use of that feature. As well as a brand new app called Substance 3D that can be used within Creative Cloud to be able to manipulate 3D assets. 
Additionally, more features are now being made available for 32-bit raw workflows in Adobe Photoshop, whereas previously you would have had to convert your image down to 16 or 8 bits. So if you want to maintain your full breadth of color detail, you can do that and still use a ton of the features in Photoshop. Now, a lot of these features have just been announced. Some of them are available in early access, limited release. Some of them are available in beta. So check your Creative Cloud app now if you are a subscriber to see if it is available. I know for some of us it is, and I will be testing those out here in the next week or so, and I'll be giving you videos as I do that. If you're interested in that kind of thing, go ahead and hit the subscribe button and turn on the bell so that you're notified when I create those new videos because I do plan on putting a lot of that out over the coming days and weeks. At the same time, if you thought that this information was helpful for you, I'd really appreciate it if you hit the like button. Obviously, social media links and links to all of my gear down below. One I do want to point out is my Instagram, which I am rebuilding after it was hacked last year. I would like to point to my most recent photo adventure trip video that I put out for my trip to Lake Tahoe, which was honestly very fun to edit, not very fun to shoot, but I learned a lot along the way and isn't that the point? But click on that right here. And obviously if you want to subscribe to the channel, you can click right here. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one.